Uh, my name is David Morrison. I am Executive Director of Historic Harrisburg Association. And uh, Historic Harrisburg is partnering with the Mary Sachs Trust uh, and with the Jewish Community Center to present tonight's program. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our partnership in a moment. Uh, tonight's program is about a little over a year in the making, and for more than one reason. Uh, we have monthly uh, educational programs at Historic Harrisburg on the fourth Monday of every month. And in June, for sort of the end of the school year, we have something out in the community, on the road. And two years ago, we were at the Camp Curtin Church, because Camp Curtin has all that Civil War history, and there was a lot to learn more than just about the church, a lot of American history and community history. The following year, we were at Grace United Methodist Church on State Street. That church was the temporary state capital when the old state capital burned down. So there's an awful lot of, of Pennsylvania government history in that church. It's just amazing. So long about that time, I was right here in this very uh, room for a large banquet honoring Peggy Grove, who is a, a, a very generous benefactor of many causes, uh, including Historic Harrisburg, and a good friend of, of many of you and of mine. So I'm here at this banquet in, in honor of Peggy Grove, and walking around the building, coming down the corridor and everything, I realized this building, this complex, is, is a virtual encyclopedia of Harrisburg's Jewish history and Jewish families. And so I thought, you know what, we have to put that on our list and have our fourth Monday program in, in uh, June uh, here at the Jewish Community Center. And that was a year ago, and everybody said, well, if you're going to do that, the only person you should get as your speaker is Dr. Simon Bronner. I contacted Simon, and he said, I would love to do it, but I'm retiring at the end of the fiscal year. The program was supposed to be on June 28th, and he was retiring from Penn State on June 30th, and he was packing up and one thing and another, and we just couldn't do it last year, so we didn't do it. So we scheduled it for this June, tonight. Meanwhile, we're getting interested in the Mary Sachs history. And Mort and Alice Spector, I visited them both on Friday, and they send you all their regards and their regrets that they can't be here, uh, because they were really instrumental in this as well. Mort uh, has been affiliated with the Mary Sachs Charitable Trust for many years, and he approached me and he said, you know, 2018 is the centennial of the opening of the Mary Sachs store. And we would like to have Historic Harrisburg help us observe the centennial. And asked me to come up with a proposal, which we and, and uh, Paul is here. Paul Hope, would you please stand up a moment? Paul is the chairman of the Mary Sachs Charitable Trust and the great nephew of Mary Sachs. So Paul, thank you for all of your help. Uh, we've, we've been to Jeb Stewart is my collaborator on this project. Jeb's father, Alan Stewart, uh, was a partner of Mary Sachs when the two, 210 or 212? 212. 212 shop, the men's shop, the men's division of Mary Sachs was opened and operated by Jeb's father, Alan Stewart. Uh, and so Jeb is working on the exhibit that's going to open uh, in September. Um, but let me, let me go back to Mort Spector for a moment. So Mort had come to Historic Harrisburg a couple of years earlier and asked us if we couldn't prevail upon Harrisburg City Council to have the stretch of 3rd Street in front of the Mary Sachs shop named Mary Sachs Way. And so we kind of knew our way around City Hall and we were able to accomplish that. And so there's a sign there, uh, you probably have noticed, that identifies that stretch of 3rd Street as Mary Sachs Way. The goal here is to brighten the memory and the visibility of Mary Sachs' legacy. 
and her store, that beautiful landmark down there on 3rd Street, is as beautiful as the day she opened it in 1931. Uh, and, uh, and there's so much more to this heritage that, uh, that we are observing. Uh, I said to Mort on Friday when I was with him, I said, what we're trying to do with this centennial observance in our exhibit is focus on three things. Number one, Mary Sachs, the business genius, let's call her. She really was a genius at business. Number two, the impact that she and her store had on the development, the growth and the development and the flourishing of downtown Harrisburg in the early decades of the 20th century, several decades, 50 years to be precise, uh, from 1918 to 1968 when it was sold to Hesse's. Uh, and the impact cannot be uh, uh, overstated. It really uh, was enormous and many other businesses flourished because Mary Sachs was the magnet. You know, it was the anchor, if you will, in modern uh, shopping mall terms uh, of downtown Harrisburg. And then the third thing that we're focusing on is the legacy of her uh, tremendous generosity to the community, her philanthropy, uh, not only while she was living, but through the Mary Sachs Charitable Trust, which uh, to this day, uh, supports uh, educational uh, endeavors and scholarships, particularly a new scholarship uh, for women who are hoping to go into either fashion or uh, fashion design or retail. Uh, and so that's a, a, a wonderful targeted uh, effort of the Mary Sex Charitable Trust and just one of many, many things they do. Uh, and you can see plaques all over town. I worked at Hack for 10 years and there's plaques. In fact, one of the gates is named for Mary Sachs. More than just a room, an entire gate to the campus. Uh, and, uh, and so that is really what we are trying to um, communicate and, and, and to really spread the word because many people today weren't even born when that store existed. Uh, and don't know, some of you in this room re remember shopping at Mary Sachs, even if it was just to go with your mother as, if you were a child. Some of you at, may have actually, in fact, a couple of you walking in tonight said, I have clothes which, which we bought at, at Mary Sachs. So you have that connection. And that's something that we want to accomplish before the year is out, is to get some of your stories, uh, your personal recollections, uh, and that's going to happen later this year. Let me call your attention to two documents you might have picked up uh, on your way in or be sure to get them on your way out. This postcard tells about our various Mary Sachs events. The next thing coming up is on Thursday, September 6th. That is the actual date, 100 years, centennial anniversary of the day Mary Sachs opened her store uh, in downtown Harrisburg in 1918. We have three things happening that day. At 9 o'clock in the morning, we're going to be on Smart Talk uh, with Scott Lamar, WITF, talking about Mary Sachs and talking about Harrisburg retail. Uh, at noon, we're going to have a ceremony right in front of the Mary Sachs shop to, uh, to commemorate the fact that it opened 100 years earlier. And in the evening at 5.30 at Historic Harrisburg Association, we're going to be opening a new exhibit, uh, and I have to get the title of this correct because we've changed it a couple of times. Let me tell you. The exhibit is going to be called uh, Harrisburg's Merchant Heritage and the Legacy of Mary Sachs. And so it's a combination of, of all the things I've just mentioned. And Jeb Stewart uh, has been working on it. He's our curator. We've got a lot of fantastic old photographs of the old stores, of the old advertisements in the Patriot News, uh, and uh, many artifacts and other things. I think it'll be a very interesting exhibit. So you're all invited uh, on September 6th. Then uh, on September 22nd, it's a Saturday, we have a walking tour of downtown Harrisburg to see some of these landmarks of Harrisburg's downtown and retail 
heritage. And then on Monday, October 22nd, we will have a program at Historic Harrisburg called Harrisburg's Retail Royalty. And we're hoping to get as many people who are members of the retail families of Harrisburg to participate in that program. It'll be a roundtable discussion, and some of you who are here tonight have commented about your connections either to Mary Sachs, to Mary Sachs store, or to other businesses, and I hope that you will be able to be part of that, and please speak to me either tonight or in the near future about that. Now, I was going to introduce myself by saying that I'm not part of Harrisburg's distinguished Morrison family. Uh, that is a regret because, wow, seven children uh, in, the, in the second generation of that family, uh, one of whom, well, I, I got to tell the story correctly. I went to a wedding, Phil Levin's wedding at the, the Blue Ridge Country Club, uh, oh, maybe 20 years ago. And I escorted an elderly lady, she asked me to be her, her escort and her driver to take her to this wonderful wedding reception. So here I am at a table for 10, all the other people are ladies in their 80s, and I was in my 30s. So I danced one after one, the next with each of these lovely old ladies at, at our table. And this one lady says to me, now what's your name? And I said, I'm David Morrison. And she looked at me and she said, I'm Mrs. David Morrison. <laughs> now, Cynthia, where are you? <laughs> Cynthia Morrison Sussman and I just had a conversation about this this evening. That was her mother. <laughs> and, uh, and her father was one of the seven, do I have that right? One of the seven Morrisons of the, of the second generation. So the Jerry Morrison and Al Morrison and the, and the I Dr. Morrisons, there were a lot of very distinguished citizens of this community. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's as close as I come to be con being connected to that family, but I, I'm very proud of that mistake. Thank <laughs> you. And uh, Cynthia also reminded me that her husband, Bob Sussman, played a huge role in downtown Harrisburg uh, business and retail and the, the, the Downtown Harrisburg Association, the Harris, Harristown Board of Directors, uh, and so there's another example of how people are, people right in this room are close to the important things that happened in our city. And I think that's pretty amazing. In a, in a large city, it's distant, you only read about them in the newspaper. Here you know them and you meet them. And I think that's very special. So that's another aspect of what I think is going to unfold uh, through this year. Now I've taken much too long, oh, one more thing. The book, uh, Merchant Princess, and this, is, this was published by the Mary Sachs Charitable Trust a couple of years ago, it, and they have them for sale out in the lobby of the building, uh, and I just read it uh, again the other day. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, view of, of Mary Sachs and, and what she accomplished. So I, I highly recommend that book. Now, Dr. Simon Bronner is one of the foremost uh, American historians, Pennsylvania historians, and Harrisburg historians uh, in our area. And as I mentioned, he, he uh, retired a year ago from Penn State Harrisburg, distinguished professor. He's the author of more than 20 books, including uh, Harrisburg's Jewish community, uh, Greater Harrisburg's Jewish community. That's the book cover right there. But he, is, he uh, has a very excellent program about our uh, Jewish community. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome and thank you, Dr. Bronner. In fact, I hope I haven't delayed you because he's going to be uh, traveling, or your wife is traveling. Somebody's traveling.
Thank you very much for coming out. This is a great turnout. I'm going to have the microphone in a second. My role in the centennial is not so much to recount the biography of Mary Sachs, since Barbara Chain Blank and people like Bruce Bazelon have certainly done a good job of that, but to contextualize her within the Jewish community in which she was a part from early age after she arrived in 1886, I believe it was, to 1960 when she died. I didn't have a chance to meet her, but I did meet her sister, Anna Sachs Cantor, and within that community, I think her story resonates a great deal of the immigrant experience and also the growth of Harrisburg, and I'm also going to have a commentary on what we can learn from that history today, in which I hope you will join in with questions and thoughts about how we can use this material that has come to light in recent years. The reason for my title, more than their share, is because in the 1860s, the Jewish advocate took notice of the rise of Harrisburg as a small city and noted that it is doing more than its share for Jewish life. And I think that story has continued, in fact, uh, to the present for reasons that I hope to explore in this little talk. If I miss out on some of the highlights, I apologize in advance, and maybe you can fill in what you think has been particularly important. Uh, we have a party going on next door. I don't know if you want to close it or let them know. When I say the materials that have come to light, I want to especially point out the contribution of Arnold Zuckerman, who was a photographer in this city, and in fact he was the official photographer of the Jewish Community Center at a time when every member had his or her ID taken. Now that is all electronic, but at the time a photographer took it, and he left a tremendous legacy. In fact, he retired and was about to throw all of it out until convinced by Bruce Bazelon that maybe he should think about donating it. And he did to the Historical Society of Dauphin County. And many of the pictures that you see are in fact from his collection. I hope in the future other photographers and even your family albums will become part of the historical record. Uh, this is what he looks like today. He is in his 90s still alive and we communicate and I know he would want to wish his best regards to the city that he loves. Sorry. All right. One of the uh, Jews began coming to Harrisburg in the 1850s and one of the first visible signs was uh, Solomon Kuhn and the Kuhn family, Samuel Kuhn as well. And they were quite visible because they were on Market Street. This photograph undoubtedly is before 1902 because you see a covered bridge over there. And you can see the sign that advertised his work in dry goods and carpets. And in fact, other Jews who came to the city, primarily from Baltimore, which had a train connection, we don't have anymore, as well as from Philadelphia, often were in the retail business even before Mary Sachs started. And some of what they introduced was in fact the secondhand retail business because that was thought to be unseemly for many other retailers. Uh, Jews did get involved. Solomon Kuhn had the store for 48 years and then transferred it to David Kaufman's store. So may remember that who was also Jewish. Another early family, primarily from Central Europe rather than Eastern Europe, uh, German Jews, was the Goldsmith family. They had 
a furniture store that was a, a landmark in what was near the new city hall at that time. And they also featured this business, which other Jews were involved in as well, of furniture. You can see the site as they sold their goods out on the street and in fact encouraged other Jews to come to the city to participate. One of the Jewish families that came was the Lohengard family. They came from Lithuania uh, originally. Again, the Joseph arrives in 1852, uh, even before there was a synagogue in town, and he gets into the pawn business. Uh, and because of uh, prohibitions against uh, Christians getting in, involved in loans, uh, Jews did get involved in the pawn business and later on in clothing. Their sons, however, got into the printing business and built in the early 20th century a building which still stands and has their name, the Lohengard Building, here it's working, but you can see the red there. And the reason why this is part of the Mary Sachs story is that Mary Sachs, while she was very successful in business, was in fact released from her first job in retail. And she appealed to the loan guards with this vision of having, instead of a secondhand store or underselling store, which is a name that I will explain shortly, a high fashion store, which must have seemed crazy at the time in Harrisburg. Uh, she was very influenced by New York City and fashion that was coming out of there. And the Lohengards took a chance and rented the space on the first floor of their building to her. Later on, they moved to next, she moved next door to establish her store. Uh, but this is her store through the mutual aid that the community provided. Other early figures who uh, still had an influence through the 20th century were the Clasters because Jews were also willing to be peddlers and drift out to the countryside and especially being Yiddish speaking, being able to communicate to many of the Pennsylvania German farmers in this region, which is a story that I've collected many times in my field work in Pennsylvania. German communities, and there are other stories about Jewish peddlers. Part of the story, too, in terms of mutual aid and why Jews stayed here is because they quickly after they arrived off the train station, which you see here before uh, likely the 1890s, because that's when the new station was built. You could see they got off and within a block they probably recognized the name of Tausig as Jewish, and they walked in and were able to converse in Yiddish and be directed as to where they should go. This was a, a very, indeed, an important aspect of coming and settling to Harrisburg in terms of a Jewish life. The first synagogue, as you can see here with the remaining photograph, was on 2nd and South Street. It was Oaf Shalom, which was started as a Orthodox synagogue and then uh, later became reformed in the 1860s. Its present structure is on Front and Seneca, which I will show you shortly here. It is in, indeed a temple form, influenced again by many of the German uh, Jews who came here. It's hard to identify civic leaders in the time we have, but I do want to give a shout out to Rabbi David Bookstaver, who was nationally known. He was appointed in Harrisburg, was very civically involved, including with uh, Mary Saxon's support of youth organizations, including the Boy Scouts, which he, and the Girl Scouts, which he was uh, very much a supporter of. See, he had a long tenure, 1924 to 1962, and he wrote an important book on American Judaism. In terms of where Jews lived, they lived in the shadow of the Capitol, in what was known as the Eighth Ward. There's a separate book like this 
by my colleague Michael Barton just on the 8th Ward. Ironically, even though they could see the Capitol, they could not work there. They were excluded from employment there, particularly because of the patronage system until civil service reform came in. But the original Kizikamuna was on Filbert Street, and State Street, was, which is still there, was the original home of Kesher Israel. Kizikamuna was, in fact, Orthodox and Yiddish speaking. And uh, later on, Kesher Israel went to another synagogue at Capitol and Briggs Streets, which was also torn down for capital expansion, which is a familiar story uh, throughout the history of Harrisburg. Kesher Israel is particularly known for the Silver Dynasty that began with Eliezer and his son David, and still people today will recount stories of the influence of David Silver, of course, the academy here. Shiva is named after him. Moses Eder was the Yiddish-speaking rabbi when he didn't speak much English according to oral histories. And then after Chizikamuna became conservative, he established a Hasidic synagogue here as well, which actually met with Kesher Israel, or in the base of Kesher Israel. This is the Chizikamuna opening, which uh, opened up in the uh, 1950s, and then you actually don't have my, you can see Hannah Sachs is right there in the first row. <laughs> and good seats there for the dedication at that time. Kesher Israel is uh, also important for introducing the modern Orthodox movement, and David Silver has great deal to do with this, and the reason why I have these numbers up, it was a wonder, and there were newspaper articles at the time talking about the resilience and the boom of the Jewish community, particularly because after World War II, the Jewish community was at a low point because of deaths of people going off the board and seeking uh, work. Chizikamuna had a sanctuary that could hold almost a thousand congregants and nine thousand square feet. And if you've never been there, it is caverns, or it seems that way, and had marble decoration and a decalogue which is uh, quite fancy and known other Photographers and historians of synagogue architecture have come here, and you can find this online with uh, discussions about it, including its modern look to <coughs> Jewish architecture. As if you look up at the ceiling, even though you should be looking at your prayer books, <laughs> but do take a look and look up. However, the, there are changes in Harrisburg and in the buildings. It has been for sale. The sign seems to be gone now. But we'll see what, what occurs with this building as well as the congregation and its community. I talk about Greater Harrisburg because there's influences on Harrisburg from Middletown and Steelton particularly. Middletown happened at Jacob. Again, the influence of Eastern Europe, Lithuania, and in terms of tradition, having the reader's table, you know, like Bima in the center of the congregation. There is also a women's balcony, even though today it is egalitarian. Louis Zacks, who also went into the clothing business, was its first president, and the building is on the National Register of Historic Places. It's a little hidden behind parties, but I would encourage you, if you're in Middletown, to go visit it. Bethel is a congregation of troublemakers, in case you don't know. <laughs> My wife and I are members as well, for that reason. And in fact, Bethel is also conservative, and this is also part of the more they, their share. Still, we have people come to us who have two conservative synagogues and with the size of this community. And yes, and there's a history there. It's because dissidents formed Bethel. 
because they wanted, oh my God, their sermons to be in English. And they, in 1925, they raised money to build this building, which was in fact designed by a nationally known architect named Clayton Lampy. And his signature, and the reason I say this about downtown Harrisburg as well, was to create minarets. And on the right is, in fact, the Payne Shoemaker Building. Again, you're not used to looking up, but if you're by the Payne Shoemaker Building, which is on 3rd Street near the Sachs Building, uh, take a look up, or if you have a helicopter, you can fly over, and you will see his signature, and it's, he also has one on the Methodist Church, I believe, on Front Street as well, if it's still Methodist. And there is a close-up, as you can see, of uh, the Jewish minaret on the top of Bethel. And it was unusual at the time because it was Moorish design, and it was really an octagonal design, not like the temple design that you saw. This is what the dark and dreary <laughs> interior looked like for many years. I know Alice will remember this and others, and then there was a renovation in the 1980s and again uh, more recently in uh, this century to put in windows. This uh, photograph does not show the uh, windows installed yet, but they are a sight to behold and there is even a book, uh, if I think your foundation actually funded on each of the windows. <coughs> Much of the history of Harrisburg then regards the immigration that came in from Eastern Europe, including, as you can see here, uh, Merv and, and Dottie Wolf in front of the wedding photo of their parents from Lithuania. These are the kinds of photographs and memories that are full of the Harrisburg history. And Although I, I don't want to single out a single family, all of them were pioneers in their own way. But certainly the Lehrman family deserves at least a, a discussion. They, they were four brothers from what is now Lithuania, uh, was then part of the Russian Pale of Settlement, where Jews were not allowed to live outside of. And, and actually, Lewis came to Middletown to be a Hebrew school teacher. But seeing opportunities in the rising factory town of Steel, they opened up a grocery store. And then I will show you some other examples uh, and then expanded into businesses with the other, with the other Lehrman's as well, including AJ's clothing store that you see on the bottom left. I did say that I would mention the Morrisons as well, even if David is not part of that family. I don't know if I'm embarrassing Sue Dan Morrison if she's here. Hmm? Oh, the, no, the picture on the right is Sue Dan Morrison, who some of you know, and that is the Morrison family shoe store that they originally set up. Ben Lehrman has this idea of becoming distributing food rather than just retailing it, and this is a, indeed an innovation that becomes quite important. Also, I.O. Silver, for whom a foundation exists today, and he stalked the sidelines of many Steelton games, and some of you may remember, but I also want to mention him again in regard to the landscape of Harrisburg because he was instrumental in the founding of B'nai B'rith Apartments downtown, which obviously continues to today. If you look at the plaque, you will see him as the uh, president of the B'nai B'rith Apartments. And, and certainly the Lehrman legacy in terms of what was Lehrman grass and uh, Harrisburg Area Community College with its rows Lehrman Auditorium, which is uh, Lois's mother. And 
the reason I mentioned their commitment to Harrisburg in 1936, there was a disastrous flood. Their warehouse is flooded. They have to make a decision. Do they leave Harrisburg there to restart their business? They committed, in fact, to Harrisburg and stayed. The Singer family, in terms of sporting goods, is, is another one. And of course, Mary Sachs originally established a Roman Garden building with her store in 1918, which expands to Reading and Lancaster as well, with a facade that uh, I think any of you passing by, or even my daughter who does not know this history, said, what is that? Why is that? And this is because of her view of wanting to bring a little bit of New York City and its fashion capital of the world to Harrisburg. Another important, I think, uh, business as well as influence in terms of philanthropy and in terms of civic engagement in the city is uh, DNH and the separate contributions of more than Alice Spector, Wade Alice for pictures there too, and as well as Schwab. And DNH, according to previous histories and newspaper articles, when they opened and came here, because they started as a tire and rubber company in Williamsport, that they were making history. Can you see the sign there? Making history in Harrisburg. This is the first truckload of RCA picture tubes, how far we've come with electronics, that this was indeed a big deal, and indeed in a second generation as well. The Brenner family has to be mentioned as well, and a lot of these businesses, because of the Jewish community, were family-centric. And this is a, an interesting story, because you have Sam Brenner, Morris Brenner, as well, and they get into different aspects of wholesaling as well as retailing in motors, as you can see there. Uh, but Sam Brenner is president of Kesher Israel for 25 years. Some of you who are involved in synagogues know it's tough to get a president to serve for one now. <laughs> but Sam Brenner was president for 25 years, and not to be outdone, his uh, brother Henry Brenner was president of Bethel for 40 years. Wow. I can imagine their family get-togethers. The arguments that they had, and this is a parade on Market Street, you can see Brenner and Sons. I hope you see that on the right side. Again, very visible, and was then the shopping center of Harrisburg before there were shopping malls. The Jewish Community Center tried to be the center of the community for many years, starting as the YMHA with the purpose, according to the historical records, to get young Jewish kids off the street. So juvenile delinquency and problems with teens is not a new problem at all. And this building then became the PAL building, and now it's a art center and it especially served business people working downtown in detail who had a chance not only the teens but also the adults where basketball was the Jewish game in Harrisburg and they play other organizations within the city. I love this uh, <laughs> photograph which I received found in the Circle Side of County. Someone had written in the names on their arms as you see there. And this was the gym, and I will say as a former player here in the Jewish Community Center, one must have taken their lives in their hand, because if you can see the baskets right up against the wall, I don't know if anybody here has memories of playing here, but not only is there no smoking in the gym, but there's a small sign there, if you can see there in white, it says no profanity. <laughs> I don't know how much that was enforced. <laughs> And the CAN, one of the most successful programs of this community, was in fact downtown until it moved up to uh, what later was known as Hades Farm and then of course to Green Hills. 
Another institution that is no longer here is the Harrisburg Hebrew School. The synagogues did not have Hebrew schools. They pooled their resources, and they had a central school, and Ben Lipsky and his wife were uh, very involved in this education until so his wife left Florida. Albert Hirsch was a, certainly a visible face of the Jewish community for more than 50 years here, as was uh, Gus Kaplan, another longtime president uh, within the community. And this you can see what was the Jewish field north of Harrisburg, uh, close to where the Harrisburg Area Community College is now. So what started to occur is that there was a Jewish neighborhood in Harrisburg that continually tended to move uptown. It was downtown in the 8th Ward, then it moved a little further up where Oed Shalom is today on Seneca Street, and then further up uptown. And I remember, in fact, uh, once talking to Mort Spector about looking for his house, which is not yes. far from where we live. And he said that he was hesitant there because it seemed to be in the sticks. This is Susquehanna Township at the time. I'm sure he remembers this and he talked about that the road wasn't paved yet. So he thought well, this isn't going anywhere. But it certainly has and what started to happen uptown, what you see on the upper right is the construction of a roof. You may not notice it, but this is significant for a city, Harrisburg, signed to have a new where people can carry things within that boundary. A sukkah hop to recognize the sukkah construction for the holiday of Sukkot, and of course, cemeteries and a mikvah, <clears throat> which you may not notice very much uh, because it looks like a plain building until I, I point out that the rain gutters go inside the building rather than outside. So this is a, a sign of that. Harrisburg is also known nationally because of its innovation of the Harrisburg plan. This may seem like common sense today, but some of you who are longtime members of this community may know at one time every Jewish organization did their own fundraising. And actually, Rabbi Bookstaber suggested, why don't we have a version of the United Fund where all the fundraising goes into a Jewish federation and then it would distribute to the different organizations that are part of the Jewish community. This became known nationally as the Harrisburg Club. And in terms of more than their share, Harrisburg was known partly uh, through thanks for the success that many of these immigrants have being particularly generous, drawing people like Stephen Wise, who was known nationally as a Jewish leader. And there was more in terms of women's activities. This is Shirley Spector, I believe in the 1950s. Uh, you can see ad advocating for a united Jewish community. And that is Horace Goldberger, who also had a vision of creating Jewish home for the age. Mary Sachs and Aaron Feinerman are community-minded leaders. They're not just Jewish leaders, but they had this idea of having Jews as part of the civic engagement of the city. And in fact, Leon Feinerman, son of Aaron, becomes city treasurer in 1971, and he was the first Jewish president of the city council. Yet some of these organizations are no longer with us, and some of it is the dispersal of the community, and some of it is also the mainstreaming of Jewish life. For example, high school Jewish fraternities were very much part of the fabric of Jewish life here, and I recorded many oral histories of people who recounted sports, social life, 
and even courtship revolving around these high school Jewish fraternities because the Jewish Community Center was turned into a prom-like ball. And there was an annual ball that was a big deal and also a place where Jewish uh, boys and girls, if I call them young men, women, met potential mavis. Young Judea is another one, and also the formation of the National Council of Jewish Women, and Hadassah had an annual show. These were women's organizations that were very involved, very civically engaged, not only for Jewish causes, but also for civic causes. David, you're also not related to Al Morrison, <laughs> but Al Morrison was also an icon of music. And he played for some of these teen balls that you see here, dressing very differently, Sally, from our children. But this was the social outlet at that time. Another aspect was drama and theater. And Harrisburg today is, in fact, known for Gamma Theater and for the community theater, and the Jewish community was very much a part of that with an annual show that drew great participation and was, in fact, a tradition. You can see how many youths here are involved, and Jen Ross, wherever she is, probably knows that the theater draws some of the largest crowds that come to the Jewish community center. Many of you know Jay Kresge and wonder about the Jay Kresge Theater as you pass on 6th Street, and because he was, in addition to being a high school principal, also very involved in community theater. And holidays and recognizing them was also a function of this community, and they also drew large crowds, as you can see, here that has been undermined somewhat by the dispersal of Boy Scouts, sisterhood rummage, which was very common, family nights, literary teas is something we don't have. I wonder about bringing them back. They were a sisterhood function from what people tell me. I never attended one, but they were a big deal. They were, in fact, a great chance to uh, socialize and show one's manners, especially because of the charge against Jews sometimes that they were uncouth. And those are some of the responses, as you see here, with contests for table displays and holiday displays. These are all Arnold Zuckerman's photographs that he took as well as the ball. Uh, George Washington's birthday was very important to Jews because of the letter that George Washington wrote the synagogue in Newport, mm -hmm. indicating that the new nation would guarantee freedom of religion, and especially for the Jews who are of great character. And with that letter, which is well known, George Washington's birthday became quite important, as well as Purim, as you can see here with some of the Purim balls as well as Jewish education. If some of you recognize yourselves in these photographs, by all means let me know. I'd like to identify more of them. And Israel, particularly in the 1950s and 1960s, became uh, very important. Mary Sachs was also part of this for Israel bonds. And this continues, in fact, to the present day. Particularly, there was a statistic after the 1967 war that the largest per capita donations came from Harrisburg. This is not the first class, but I believe an early class. It was the third class. Some of you recognize some of the people here, but this was also something that seemed like more than a share of Jewish day school in a city with around 6,000 Jews seemed to be out of question. The height of the Jewish community was in 1980 with influxes from Russian Jews and the growth of government. And so then it got to 10,000. It's probably back down to about six today. 
And I have to give a shout out also to another institution that many people thought would be unfeasible in this community, and that is a Hebrew high school. And what you see here is a shot from what was Hebrew high. You can see the new caucus. Benson, now there's some money back there. So that uh, certainly dates it, and which has now been renamed and re-envisioned as follow-up Senator Joe Bronner. Bar mitzvahs and bach mitzvahs also became part of the fabric of Jewish life and one of the ways that even with dispersal that Jews had a social calendar of bar and bach mitzvahs, especially between it seemed like March and June, <laughs> in which they got together. They were not a big deal before World War II, but seemed to accelerate, particularly in the 1960s, as you see here. Friedenberg is obviously still around today. And by the way, his photographs were destroyed in the flood of 1972. So he was very grateful for Arnold Zuckerman and for our saving Arnold Zuckerman's photographs because he didn't have his picture, as you see there. Weddings. Uh, this is not invasion of privacy. This is in Arnold Zuckerman's collection. I guess you must have hired him to do your photography. At weddings, there was an issue whether weddings should be in a synagogue. Because weddings are joyful, and the synagogue is supposed to be a very sobering experience. And it's really in the 1950s that synagogue weddings became more acceptable. As you see here, it looks like you have a, a fence there, Alice. Over there. And that is uh, Alice feeding more. And Spitz is uh, Gary Spitz wedding. And of course, the Jewish community moves uptown. There was some commentary in the community review with some letters to the community review wondering whether uh, this was a good idea moved here because uh, land was cheap and there wasn't much else here. But people wondered whether it was a good idea because this seemed far away <laughs> from the Jewish community at the time. What am I talking about? This is what it looked like. This is before Route 81 was there. And when I mentioned about Susquehanna Township, uh, there wasn't much in Susquehanna Township at the time. Susquehanna Township started really at the JCC, but at the time it was built, there were a few houses, as you can see there, but mostly forests. And some of the innovations in terms of social life, a bowling alley, which we no longer have, art classes. And what you see there in the lower right is a registration drive to uh, get teens and to have charm classes for maybe that we need to bring that back <laughs> and you can see here in terms of my mentioning about members it had 1500 members this is in 1957 and they want to have a, a drive to sign up 1500 with her able to sell Finkelstein it got to 5500 1960 with 98% on the East Shore. This is what the bowling alley looked like after the flood. In 72, it was rebuilt. Pisicamuna was rebuilt, again with a commitment to Harrisburg. But part of the story of the 72 flood was that originally the Jewish home was supposed to be next to the Jewish community center. And after the flood, Morris Goldberg reviewed his options and said, let's move to Susquehanna Township and place it there above the floodplain, where the Jewish Community Center can be changed. What you also see here is the Blue Ridge Country Club that also is near there and was known as a Jewish social center. Why? because other country clubs excluded Jews and blacks. And the Blue Ridge Country Club 
was actually bought from owners who wanted to create an exclusive country club that would continue to exclude Jews and blacks. A consortium was raised and bought it and then opened it up and made it inclusive. So that is, I think, a shrine that will no longer be there. Uh, <coughs> And in terms of this, this community continues to be wary of anti-Semitism. There have been incidents, such as this one on the steps of uh, Shalom, and I can't say that the community has responded well after these incidences. And even in the 1960s, part of the history of the civil rights movement, especially the National Council of Jewish Women, was not only to fight anti-Semitism, but to advocate for racial equality and ethnic equality for others as well. Here you see they're picketing Woolworths because of Woolworths segregation policy after Greensboro, North Carolina, and the sit-in there by college students. As you can see here, Brotherhood Week. I don't know who these people are. Maybe Alice will, but you can tell me later. But they're distributing on behalf of the National Council of Jewish Women the, uh, a call for racial equality for Brother of the that is in Pomeroy's, which is also not downtown. Mentions of the Holocaust are few during this time, but picks up particularly in the 1980s with people like Leo Montemont or Sam Sharon Curtin <coughs> Moses, their support and this uh, monument built there, in addition to the uh, support in terms of Penn State Harrisburg, where I was, and it was my pleasure to work with Linda Schwab and her family to establish a center for Holocaust and Jewish studies, and this is her with her brothers. was a renovation and a decision about the Jewish Community Center, whether to stay in Harrisburg or again move. It recommitted, and as you can see here, the, the Jewish home, and now the Jewish residence as well, which was built further up. Dispersal starts with the West Shore. This is an advertisement about an, a synagogue on the West Shore, which must have seemed unheard of. It's 1974, it's pretty late. And uh, just quickly, some of the civic leaders and the question about where the new generation of civic leaders and people who are committed not only to the Jewish community but also to Harrisburg life will come from here. Menneker for whom the center downtown is named is there. This is uh, Alice Spector, who is with us today. I can't even, it would take all night to enumerate all the organizations of which you've been a part, and as Miriam Menneker also was. There are a few men to mention, too. Dick Simons, who also was in city government, Alex Grass, uh, Judge Lipset, Hurwitz, family and firemen who have continued to hold exercise classes in the Jewish residence in her 90s. Lee Javich, established a Javich fund here, Aronson family, and as well as Mark Friedberg and others. So in the 21st century, I think that we uh, do indeed have talent, perhaps not the uh, kind of fervid organizational work that we had, but we certainly, I, I think, are trying to develop our talent. including our 
children and these programs to work children through Hebrew High School or Sababa and others into a civic life which now covers from Hershey to Sunbury to Carlisle. People travel, but will they make that commitment is part of the question. I close with a message that this history, I think, does matter to give us an idea of the legacy that was here, of the pride that should be taken in Harrisburg, in spite of the condescending attitude of the Jewish advocate, which was published in Philadelphia, and the 1860s, Harrisburg is this frontier outpost. I think that it has come into its own. It has its own history. It has figures and leaders and institutions and a, and a landscape of which we can be just proud. Thank you. tour of this facility for those of you who have not been here before. I know many of you know this building like the back of your hand. We also have refreshments and we would like to have some socializing. Let me divide the uh, questions into two parts. If you have a question for Simon, we'll start with those. If you have a comment in general about this subject matter that doesn't require an answer from Simon, we'll let him go and those other comments, which I would welcome from anybody because I know there's a lot of wealth of information in the room. So first question for Simon. All right. Uh, there's certainly great detail that you could not touch on everything, obviously, uh, but, but it's a good job. Yeah. Thank you. That was a uh, great presentation on the various uh, variety of uh, business uh, stores and the uh, uh, various economic aspects because that fits right in with Mary Sachs, of course. But, and the uh, question here, though, is and she was certainly part of that conversation with those right. others. Okay. And so, uh, given the between the war periods, the two world wars, uh, you see the uh, economic development. How did they fare during the Depression years? And there again, understandably, you couldn't go into tell a whole program on that. But were they able to uh, hold their own, maybe had some retrenching, so to speak, and then rebound when things got better? Uh, any, any insight on that as best we can in the time we have? Thank you. Uh, that is a critical period. And it was a tough period in Harrisburg, as with other places. I will say that main source of my information is from the community review and concerns about loss of the population, some of the population here. And Mary Sachs figures into that because she actually expands during the 1930s. She's taking a chance for recovery. So rather than closing up, she in fact begins to expand and that inspiration, if you will, also affected some of the others who were here. And you know, this is particularly in some of the diversification which occurs at the time. I mentioned to you that many of the Jews were involved in, in jewelry, pawn, and clothing. Also in some scrap metal, too, if you go on 6th Street, there's still some leftovers from that. Uh, but some of them are starting to look at uh, wholesaling, dis distribution, uh, candy, cigar, tobacco, and so forth. Some of the change that occurs, though, is that after that period, the next generation is not as involved in business as that first and second generation are. So some of the change was that in order to stay here, they're not going to be involved in business, they're going to be looking for more of the professions. It's partly some of the process that occurs. Right. Next question. 
Alluding to what you just said, uh, shopping malls opened up, and the Jewish merchants downtown could not compete. And the, the uh, Miller's Furniture Store went out, Feller's went out, Herman Shoe Store went out, Mary Sachs held her own because Mary Sachs had a very special way of getting money. She had no money. She would go to the bank and take out a loan. Then she and Hannah would get on the train to New York and buy three dresses. And they came back, they came back with the dresses and you would sit in this gorgeous lounge and they would present ask you what you need the dress for and bring out one dress. If that wasn't right, they brought out the second dress. Then they brought out the third dress. That was your choice. That's how I got my wedding wardrobe together. So uh, David could tell you more about that. But she was really something else. She was a very close friend of Rabbi Bookstaver's. Rabbi Bookstaver wanted a camp for the Boy Scouts, and he went to Mary for money. And Mary went to the bank and took out a loan and gave it to Rabbi Bookstaver to build the Boy Scout camp. And it went on and on. There's many, many, many stories. One of the critical times was 1948, when Israel was established. And we worked very hard to raise money. Per capita, Harrisburg raised the largest amount of money for the size of what we were, 5,000 Jews. We raised the most money for the size of our city in the United States. Wow. So that's how hard we worked on it. Thank you, Alice. Yes, when I was visiting Wharton Alice on Friday, Alice showed me her collection of Mary Sachs originals, and they're just amazing. So, and a couple of you, we spoke earlier, you have uh, uh, heirloom uh, garments from Mary Sachs, and we do want to follow up in some fashion. I don't know just what we're going to do, but at some point, there needs to be a permanent collection somewhere, somehow, for these things to, to be kept indefinitely uh, for the appreciation of, of, of everybody. Next question. Let me just quickly say, too, while you're bringing that over. No, go ahead. This is the Mary Sachs Auditorium, obviously. And in case you miss it, there's a little alcove on your way out where there's some Mary Sachs memorabilia. So take a look at that. There is a story that Barbara Blank recounts that Mary Sachs was asked, why don't you franchise? You have a brand, the Mary Sachs brand. And supposedly she responded that she wanted to be hands-on. She didn't want to be in a situation in which she would not be her customers. So she refused uh, to do that. She wanted to keep it a human kind of encounter in her shops that made it different from the department stores when they started arising uh, you used the word, I think it was underselling. Um, oh, yes. Would, would you be able to explain the story behind that? Yes. Uh, David Kaufman opened up the underseller store in Market Square, which was replacing the Cunes. And this was uh, partly a class thing, but it was also an ethnic thing as well because there were certain stores, according to some of the articles, that either excluded Jews, immigrants, and blacks, or else uh, charged higher prices. Because it was not a custom to have a set price in a large part of the 19th century. You would walk in, say what you needed, and then someone would sell you what you wanted according to how much they thought 
they would get from it. So uh, part of the innovation of these Jewish sellers was to have a set price and to open it up. And by underseller, they meant that they undersold the standard uh, clothing and furniture <coughs> kinds of establishment. But David Kaufman, I guess, had chutzpah, if I can use that word, to actually put that in his title. So it wasn't, it was Saul Kuhn, as you can see, carpets and dry goods. David Kaufman in an advertiser, you can look at microfilm of the Harrisburg Patriot, will say Kaufman's The Underseller Story. <laughs> One more question. And then, by the way, uh, Jen Ross, who is the executive director here, is going to conduct the tour. Jen, Jen has been very helpful with getting all of the technology functioning tonight. She's backstage, but she'll conduct the tour as soon as we have one more question. It's not really more of a contributing, and I wish my father were here, Leonard Berman, to better answer it, but he, started, he said after World War II, anti-Semitism is why some businesses started because my grandmother, whose name was Edith Cole, it would have been Edith Berman, but my father's father died when he was two, uh, started Cole and Company Office Furniture because she knew when they came back from World War II, they would be the last people to get jobs in Harrisburg because there was a lot of anti-Semitism. So she started the office furniture, and it was pooling and help from other Jewish businesses. And I don't know the whole story, but critical times when, say, a truck would be loaned or other this is helping them out so that they could survive. So I think the support of others is helpful. Thank you. All right, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you very much, Simon. Safe travels. <laughs> With that, I want to introduce Jen Ross, the executive director, uh, who will tell you a little bit about the center and conduct the optional tour for those of you who are interested. Jen, and thanks for your hospitality and making tonight's event possible. Big help. Thank you, David. And thank you for bringing this amazing program, and thank you, Simon, for teaching us a little bit more about the history. So for those of you who don't know much about the center, we're kind of an interesting organization that we are what's called a functional federation, that we're a federation and a Jewish community center. And one other important thing is we are open to the entire community. That's something that all of our services and programs are available to people regardless of their religious affiliation. And we have a multitude of programs here. Uh, we have an amazing early learning center uh, that's in the space that used to be housed by the bowling alley, and we have a fitness center, and we do a lot of sports and recreation activities, everything from itty bitty basketball to soccer shouts, and now we're a site for girls on the run, to all sorts of teen and adult programming uh, with sports and activities. We have an amazing senior club that meets here Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's open to anybody in the community, uh, age 60 and up, and if you're friends with someone 60, you can come to the program, or if you just want to come to the program, you can come. Tomorrow we have a sold-out program. We're bringing uh, the son of a member of the community, David Kopp, who's going to be here playing on the piano and entertaining us. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful program, but I do encourage those of you interested to reach out to Cheryl Yablon for future programming because we bring in a lot of amazing programs, everything from historians to people who uh, talk about sports. And anyone who knows Herman Kopp in the community, he gives a very engaging talk at least once a month about sports and politics. We have other musical performances. Uh, Stuart Molina usually comes with one or more of his children each year. And there's just a lot of great fun in, in the center. Um, Off-site, uh, Green Hills was mentioned earlier. That's just about a 10 minute drive here off of Fishing Creek, across from where Felicia Tai used to be. Uh, we have an amazing day camp program there that uh, started last week. We're in our second week at Green Hills. And prior to that, we had um, a great Bricks for Kid program that was here. And uh, next week, we have a really amazing program that I encourage you to watch out for called Circus of the Kids. You will watch children from our community become Cirque du Soleil stars. They'll be in our gymnasium uh, next Friday, uh, Friday next week, and they will be doing all sorts of really amazing tricks that you just cannot believe. So I encourage you to watch for tickets for that. 
and we do a lot of wonderful cultural programs. We're the fiscal agent for the, uh, the Jewish Film Festival, which typically starts here and then heads over to the Midtown Cinema. We're the fiscal agent for Kol Anishama, our uh, Jewish chorus in the community. And we're really the unifying agency for all of our wonderful synagogues and agencies. And we do love to do a lot of outreach in the community as well. Um, are there people here interested in a tour and or do people have questions? 